Hello and welcome back to Classic Books with Ostara and the Lily here. And tonight we're going to get back to the political ideas of St. Thomas Aquinas. Get my glasses on. And get there. See where we're at. We are at question 92 of the effects of law in two articles. <coughs> We must now consider the effects of law under which head there are two points of inquiry, whether an effect of law is to make men good, whether the effects of law are to command, to forbid, to permit, and to punish as the jurist as the jurist states. First article, whether an effect of law is to make men good. We proceed thus to the first article. Objection one, it seems that it, it is not an Effect of law to make <clears throat> men good. For men good are good through virtue, since virtue is stated in ethics. Six is that which makes its subject good, but virtue is in man from God alone, because he it is who works it in us without us, as we stated above, and giving the definition of virtue, therefore the law does not make men good. Further, the law does not profit a man unless he obeys it. Yes, that, that's true. Um, number one, just because there's a law, it doesn't make people good, and it does not profit you if you do, do not obey it. So if um, there there are, say, traffic laws, and you disobey them, that's and you get yourself killed in an accident, it's not very profitable. But the very fact that a man obeys a law is due to his being good. Therefore, in man, goodness is presupposed to the law. Therefore, the law does not make men good. Further, law is ordained to the common good, as stated above. That some behave well in things regarding the community, who, who behave well, ill in things regarding themselves. Therefore, it is not the business of the law to make men good. Further, some laws are tyrannical, as the philosopher says. But a tyrant does not tend the good of his subjects, but considers his only his own profit. Therefore, law does not make men good. We had gotten into that in Plato. On the contrary, the philosopher says that the intention of every lawgiver is to make good citizens. I answer that as stated above. A law is nothing else than a dictate of reason in the ruler by which his subjects are governed. Now, the virtue of any subordinate thing consists in its being well subordinated to that by which it is regulated. Thus, we see that the virtue of the irascible and corcupiscible faculties consists in their being obedient to reason, and accordingly, the virtue of every subject consists in his being well subjected to the ruler, to his ruler, as the philosopher says. But every law aims at being obeyed by those who are subject to it. Consequently, it is evident that the proper effects of law is to lead its subjects to their proper virtue. And since virtue is that which makes its subject good, it follows that the proper effects of law is to make those, hi Lily, <laughs> excuse me, who, to whom it is given good, either simply or in some particular respect. For if the intention of the lawgiver is fixed on true good, which is the common good regulated according to divine justice, it follows that the effect of the law is to make men good simply. If, however, the intention of the lawgiver is fixed on that which is not simply good, but useful or pleasurable to himself or in opposition to divine justice, then the law does not make men good simply. But in respect to that particular government, in this way, in this way good is found even in things that are bad of themselves. <clears throat> Thus a man is called a good robber because he works in a way that is adapted to, the, to his end. Virtue is twofold, as explained above. Acquired and infused, now the fact of being accustomed to an action contributes to both, but in different ways, for it causes the acquired virtue, while it disposes to infuse virtue and, and preserves and fosters it when it already exists. And since law is given for the purpose of directing human acts, as far as human acts conduce to virtue, so far does law make men good. 
Wherefore, the philosopher says in the second book of the politics that lawgivers make men good by habituating them to good works. It is not always through perfect goodness of virtue that one obeys the law, but sometimes it is through fear of punishment and sometimes from the mere dictate of reason, which is the beginning of virtue as stated above. The goodness of any part is considered in comparison with the whole. Hence Augustine says that, and seemly is the part that harmonizes not with the whole, since then every man is part of the state. It is impossible that a man be good unless he will be proportionate to the common good. Nor can the whole be well consistent unless its parts be proportionate to it. Consequently, the common good of the state cannot flourish unless the citizens be virtuous, at least those whose business it is to govern. But it is enough for the good of the community that the other citizens be so far virtuous that they obey the commands of their rulers. Hence, the philosopher says that the virtue of a sovereign is the same as that of a good man. But the virtue of any common citizen is not the same as that of a good man. A tyrannical law, through not being according to reason, is not a law, absolutely speaking, but rather a perversion of a law. And yet, so far as it is something in the nature of a law, it aims at the citizens being good, for all it has in the nature of a law consists in it being an ordinance made by superior to his subjects, and aims at being obeyed by them, which is to make them good, and not simply, but with respect to that particular government. And governments usually come through force, whoever has the biggest army, and I think that's the bottom line right there. And then the, the army, if the army obeys that particular government and obeys the orders, then they're the winners, so to speak through force of violence and what have you. Whether the acts of law are suitably assigned, second article. We proceed thus to the second article. It would seem that the acts of law are not suitably assigned as consisting in command, prohibition, permission, and punishment. For every law is a general pre precept, as the jurist states, but command and precept are the same. Therefore, the other three are superfluous. Further, the effect of a law is to induce its subjects to be good, as stated above. But counsel aims at a higher good than a command does. Therefore, it belongs to, a, to law to counsel rather than to command. Further, just as punishment serves a man to good deeds, so does reward. Therefore, if to punish is reckoned in effect of law, so also is to reward. Uh, to reward. Further, the intention of a lawgiver is to make men good, as stated above, but he that obeys the law merely through fear of being punished is not good. Because although a good deed may be done through servile fear, i.e. fear of punishment, it is not done well. In other words, they're doing the good deed through force. It's not from, in, from here. So then they're really not a good person. Therefore, punishment is not a proper effect of law. On the contrary, Isidore says, every law either permits something as, a brave man may demand his reward or forbid something as, no man may ask a consecrated virgin in marriage or punishes as, let him that commits a murder be put to death. And that's probably why God himself gives people free will because if they don't have free will, then it's not really not real, their subservience to him or their obedience to him or whatever you want to call it is not real. They're not really good. So maybe in the end he has a method to his madness. I answer that just as assertion is a dictate of reason asserting something, so it was a law, a dictate of reason commanding something. Now it is proper to reason to lead from one thing to another. Wherefore, just as in demonstrative sciences, the reason leads us from certain principles to assent to the conclusion, so it induces us by some means to assist to assent to the precept of the law. Now, the precepts of law are concerned with human acts. 
and which the law directs as stated above. Again, there are three kinds of human acts. For as stated above, some are acts of good, generally acts of virtue, and in respect of these, the law of the ver law is excuse me, the act of the law is a precept or command, for the law commands all acts of virtue. Some acts are evil generically, acts of vice, and in respects of these the law forbids. Some acts are generically indifferent, and in respect of these law these the law permits, and all acts that are either not distinctly good or not distinctly bad may be called indifferent. And it is <clears throat> the fear of punishment that law makes use of in order to ensure obedience in which respect punishment is in effect of law. And, and that what, is the reason we need government because if you don't have <coughs> laws concerning hurting other people, then it would be chaos. And then people still commit bad acts of violence. And it just seems to be getting worse. But it could be even worse if they didn't have laws out there it'd be a lot worse we wouldn't be safe at all just as to cease from evil is a kind of good so a prohibition is a kind of precept and accordingly taking precept in a wide sense every law is a kind of precept and another, another respect on that having we need laws because if we didn't have them we like i said we wouldn't be safe inside of our house own house would be setting up our night watches inside of a house with firearms to make sure nobody breaks in and we'd be on like like guard duty we'd be like the animals constantly watching out because animals live on instinct but we'd have to sit up with with a firearm guarding our own home to make sure nobody broke in and it would just it would be, be awful Devise is not a proper act of law, but may be within the competency of a private person who cannot make a law. Wherefore, to the apostle, after giving a certain counsel, says, I speak not the Lord. Consequently, it is not reckoned as an effect of law. To reward may also pertain to anyone, but to punish pertains to none. But the framer of the law, by whose authority the pain is inflicted. Wherefore to reward is not reckoned an effect of law, but only to punish. From becoming accustomed to avoid evil and fulfill what is good through fear of punishment, from being accustomed to avoid evil and fulfill what is good through fear of punishment, one is sometimes led on to do so otherwise, to likewise, excuse me, with the light and of one's own accord. Accordingly, Law, even by punishment, leads men on to being good. So in other words, it's saying that the uh, good example leads to, to ver the better virtue leads to, can lead to, you being, to people being good. And we're on question 93. We might as well go on to that one. So that's close to, okay. Here we go. <clears throat> of the eternal law in six articles... We must now consider each law by itself. One, the eternal law. Two, the natural law. Three, the human law. Four, the old law. Five, the new law. Which is the law of the gospel, or the sixth law, which is the law of the foams. Suffice what we have said when treating of original sin. Concerning the first, there are six points of inquiry. What is the eternal law? Whether it is known to all, whether every law is derived from it, whether necessary things are subject to the eternal law, whether natural contingencies are subject to the eternal law, whether all human things are subject to it. First article, whether the eternal law is a sovereign type existing in God. We proceed thus to the first article. Objection one. It would seem that, that the eternal law is not a sovereign type existing in God, for there is only one law, but there are many types of things in the divine mind. For Augustine says that God made, made each thing according to its type. Therefore, the eternal law does not seem to be a type existing in the divine mind. Further, it is essential to a law that it be promulgated by word, as stated above. But word is a personal name in God, as stated in the first part, whereas type refers to the essence. Therefore, the eternal law is not the same as a divine type. Let me read the next page. <laughs> 
Further, Augustine says, we see a law above our minds, which is called truth. But the law which is above our minds is the eternal law. Therefore, truth is the eternal law. That's what I'm saying. Truth is the eternal law. That's the most important law, is truth. And if uh, it's false, and if you find anything doesn't make sense, then it's likely false. And that's what you gotta, what we gotta fight. We gotta fight for truth. But the idea of truth is not the same as the idea of a type. Therefore, the eternal law is not the same as the sovereign type. On the contrary, Augustine says that the eternal law is the sovereign type, to which we must always conform. I answer that, just as in every artificer, there pre-exists a type of the things that are made by his art, so too in every governor there must pre-exist the type of the order of those things that are to be done by those who are subject to his government. And just as the type of the things yet to be made by an art is called the art or exemplar of the products of that art, so too the type in him who governs the acts of his subjects bears the character of a law, provided the other conditions be present which we have mentioned above. Now God by his wisdom is the creator of all things in relation to which he stands as the artif artificer oh, let's have that on. <laughs> to the products of his art as stated in the first part. Moreover he governs all the acts and movements that are to be found in each single creature as was always stated in the first part. Wherefore as the type of the divine wisdom inasmuch as by it all things are created has the by all things are created has the character of art exemplar or idea. So the type of divine wisdom as moving all things to their due end bears the, the character of law. Accordingly, the eternal law is nothing else than the type of divine wisdom as directing all actions and movements. Augustine is speaking in that passage of the ideal types which regard the proper nature of each single thing and consequently in them there there is a, cer a certain distinction in plurality according to their different relations to things as stated in the first part. But law is said to direct human acts by ordaining them to the common good as stated above, and things which are in themselves different may be considered as one accordingly as they are ordained to one common thing. Wherefore, the eternal law is one, since it is the type of this order. With regard to any sort of word, two points may be considered. The word itself and that which is expressed by the word. For the spoken word is something uttered by the mouth of man and expresses that which is signified by the human word. The same applies to the human mental word, which is nothing else than something conceived by the mind, by which man expresses his thoughts men mentally. So then in God, the word conceived by the intellect of the Father is the name of a person, but all things that are in the Father's knowledge, whether they refer to the essence or to the persons or to the works of God, are expressed by this word as Augustine declares. And, amid, and among other things expressed by this word, the eternal law itself is expressed thereby. Nor does it follow that the eternal law is a personal name in God yet. Yet it is appropriated to the Son on account of the kinship between type and word. Now, this is my thought is that God himself is the universe. And then, because uh, I know a lot of believe in the Trinity, I'm not necessarily a follower of the Trinity. I believe in one God, you know, in the universal God. Um, St. Thomas Aquinas is obviously Catholic. But I believe in one universal God, and yes, I do believe in his, that he created the Son, who, thereby being the second most powerful being in the universe, is still second to his Father. And then they talk the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't believe the Holy Spirit is a different, it's, it's just, the Holy Spirit is something that he has within himself, it's, it's uh, it's not three, it's just 
one one universe, which is actually a father and a mother because there's really not a gender, but for argument's sake, we'll say father because and then the son, the two, probably a mother. Okay, we'll get back to where it was at here. And what does it follow to the eternal law as a personal name in God? Yet it is appropriated to the Son on account of the kinship between type and word. The types of the divine intellect do not stand in the same relation to things as the types of the human intellect, for the human intellect is measured by things, so that a human concept, not true by reason of itself, but by reason of its being consonant with things, since the fact that a thing is Excuse me, I'm lost, I'm lost, I'm lost. Thing it is or is not determines whether the opinion is true or false, but the divine intellect is that measure of things, since each has so far truth in it as represents the divine intellect of a state in the first part. Consequently, the divine intellect is true in itself when its type is truth itself. Okay, yeah. just looking back here. Right here it said, So then in God, the word conceived by the intellect of the Father is the name of a person, that all things that are in the Father's knowledge, whether they refer to the essence, or to the persons, or to the works of God, are expressed by this word, as Augustine declares, and among other things, expressed by this word, the eternal law itself, expressed thereby, nor does it follow the eternal law. It's a personal name, and God yet is appropriate to the Son on account of the kinship between type and we're, oh, okay. So we are going to end tonight right here. And we'll be getting into the second article, whether the law, eternal law is known to all, in the next video. If you enjoyed this video, please be sure to hit like, subscribe, comment below. Stay tuned for more from Mustara and Lily from with classic books from Ostara. Stay tuned for more.